Hi, I'm Katie Culver. We're back for another Media Law Chat. I'm here today with my friend and fellow Media Law Geek, Janelle Belmas. Janelle, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from and what case you're going to be covering today. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Katie. This is going to be pretty fun uh, because I have the best case ever. It's Texas versus Johnson. Actually, I, I forgot. I have to tell you where I'm from, and I'm from the University of Kansas. I'm an associate professor at the William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Comm at the University of Kansas. Uh, and I got too excited because I do get the best case ever, and that's Texas versus Johnson. Uh, and I, in talking about that, we're going to talk about a couple of cases before, just briefly, and a case after, because you can't really talk, even the Texas versus Johnson is kind of the biggie, you can't really talk about uh, flag desecration, flag burning, in um, just in one case, because it's a whole history of delicious, delightful law. And <laughs> right. uh, I'm writing a book, well, I'm writing a book on the earlier cases, because Texas versus Johnson is pretty well covered. Mm -hmm. But the earlier case is a little less so. So some of the ones from the Vietnam era where I'm really deeply interested, there were 80 some cases in that era that had to do with flag desecration. And three of them were Supreme Court cases during a very short period of time. So um, we get to talk about all those things, best stuff ever. All right, excellent, all right. let's dig in. So okay. tell me, why did you choose this case as your top case or why do you call it the best case ever? Best case ever. Well, um, to me it is, Flags have always fascinated me, I guess, and the American flag is both is more and less than what people like to say it is, right? Uh, if you read the case, Justice uh, Rehnquist does a very long discussion, Chief Justice Rehnquist does a very long discussion on the historical value of the flag as a symbol. But I, when I mention this, when I talk about this case to people in international settings or to my students, they all say, well, you know, it, my international students and international colleagues say, well, you know, we're the United States is weird about flags. It's, we, get, we worship them in ways that, that most other countries just don't. And, you know, flag desecration. I mean, I've had students complain after class when we talk about the case because they think, you know, I, and I tell students always, you, know, you don't have to agree. You just have to know, right? Mm -hmm. It's completely okay if you don't agree with flag desecration, right? But to me, the reason this, this uh, case is so interesting and critical, not only for the case structure itself, but because of the ways in which it engages uh, the popular imagination in a sense about how we deal with this huge important symbol. And regardless of what we think of our administration right now, the administration, uh, the, the, high, the high guy's tweets have really been helpful to my research because every now and then he'll tweet about how you know, you don't like our country, go home. And if you want to burn our flag, go home. And it's, to me, flags are sort of a touch point of, of the difference between patriotism and nationalism. And I have long suggested that we can be very patriotic and still burn a flag. Um, because if the First Amendment means anything, it means protection for the speech we don't like. And that's a, tr you know, very traditional liberal speech perspective. And to me, this, this case highlights it. Plus, it came out, I think, correctly and so did Eichmann, which is the case that came right afterwards because the court recognized, even some of the more conservative justices, Scalia signed on, uh, very conservative justice, that, and Kennedy's line was if the long con the Constitution compelled the result. And to me that suggests a, you know, a willingness of the court, at least then, and this was 1989, uh, to consider even speech we find uh, repulsive. And, you know, this is not the only case in which protected, you know, speech that was repulsive was protected. I mean, uh, I'm now living in Kansas and uh, Topeka is right next door and the Westboro Baptist Church is right next door. So, you know, the uh, Supreme Court protected the speech, the protest speech on funerals. So, but uh, Texas versus Johnson came down right before I was going to go back to graduate school, which dates me t totally, but that's okay. Uh, and I remember having long discussions with people about how I thought this was the right decision and that even if it were legal to burn a flag, it was mandatory. And, you know, we talk a lot uh, in class about uh, ways in which to deliver, you know, particularly in strategic communication, although I teach mostly in news side, you know, how you get your message out. And I always tell students, you know, just be careful. You know, you probably don't want to burn a flag uh, because you'll lose your message in the burning of the flag. Like Colin Kaepernick, unfortunately, lost the message when he, I think he lost part of his message for Black Lives Matter when he, you know, chose to kneel. Uh, for the national anthem at the National Football League. So that's the basics. Let's start with the case before Texas versus Johnson. So let's okay. begin, begin before the beginning. <laughs> okay. So in the 1960s and 70s, uh, the Vietnam uh, War was in full swing. 
uh, along with the protest movements that had to do with that. And I got interested in this and I was going to do a retrospective sort of on Texas versus Johnson. And when I looked at that, when I gathered all the cases, I realized that there was this huge chunk of them between 1967 and 1974 or five. Uh, of like 80 cases, of which three were Supreme Court cases. And those, these were all flag desecration cases. Mm -hmm. And Texas versus Johnson overturned 48 state flag desecration uh, rules, laws, and, the, and a federal one. But these laws went back a long time, right? In fact, Halter, the Halter case uh, went all the way back to 1905, right? And that's a case on advertising using the flag. So the cases during that Vietnam era, there are three of them, Spence, Spence, Smith, and Street. <laughs> but and, and for time purposes, I think the one that's most interesting is Street. Uh, uh, Street, ver New, uh, Street versus New York. And the case happened when uh, James Meredith was snipered, snipered, is that a word, sniped, <laughs> killed by a sniper bullet. Uh, and when, when um, Sidney Street heard about this, he took his, he's living in New York, he took his own flag out of a de desk drawer, went down to a New York street corner and lit it on fire. And when the police came up, he said to them, um, yes, this is my flag. If they can do that to Meredith, we don't need no damn flag, which I love. I love that quote. Um, in fact, I think the title of my book is gonna be No Damn Flag, we'll see. Cause I think it's a really key quote. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court, so he's arrested under the New York flag desecration law. And the Supreme Court uh, overturns that conviction because they couldn't decide whether Street was punished for the burning of the flag, which is uh, problematic, right? The actual burning, the torching, the lighting it, or his speech, which they said should be protected. And John Hart Ely, uh, you know, in, uh, had a really good dis discussion of uh, the flag burning case, that particular set of flag burning cases in the 1970 law review, which I wrote for wrote my essay on for Kamala and policy. Uh, they have, were having this big retrospective. And I chose that because he pointed out that it was really key, like in an earlier case, or in a case called O'Brien, the court recognized this very close distinct, or very close connection between speech and action. Mm -hmm. And in Street, they kind of tried to split the baby, right? But the idea here was that you can't really disentangle them. Right. Um, and so Street set up the idea that this is a communicative act that has potentially some value, okay? Mm -hmm. And then all these other cases that sort of cl clump around it, both state and federal, you know, the other 80 whatever of them, had to do mostly with, uh, they had a lot of desecration cases, but also wearing the flag as clothing. Mm -hmm. um, just one case, uh, I think it was in New York also case, Second Circuit case, somebody took a flag and sewed it together like a person and stuffed it and then hung it with a noose a, as an art installation. Um, people wore the thing as capes. They put it, made it as backpacks. They laid it out on the ground for picnics. Uh, they wore it as patches, which of course we can buy a patch on Amazon now and stick it on our butts or wherever we want to stick it, right? So whatever you want. Um, but a lot, in fact, there was one case, and I think this was earlier, where a woman was arrested simply for miming harming the flag. If I had that flag, I would tear it up. And they put her in jail for that. So we were very, we've been very hyper about flags for a long time. Okay. So fast forward then to, to, to Texas for, and is that okay? Moving to Texas versus Johnson? Okay, so 1989, Gregory Lee Johnson, and those of you who know the case know, you know the basics, but in case you don't, stands on the Dallas courthouse steps and says, America, the red, white, and blue, we spit on you. Takes somebody fl a flag that somebody gives them and torches the thing and is arrested. And case goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, there's bedrock principle underlying this. It's not that no official gets to say, what speech is orthodox, okay? And that's a quote from an earlier case. But the idea here is that this was monumental. Court said, it was a thing on Twitter, this is why another reason I like this case, is because it can be summarized quickly in five words. Go ahead, torch that flag. <laughs> Which to me is exactly what they said. They said, okay, if there is an idea here behind um, freedom of expression, it's gotta protect the speech we don't like. And we don't like flag burning, it's not that we, think flag burning is awesome, but we do recognize the communicative message, the message that a flag burner wants to, to get across. And this was not a unanimous decision. This was a five to four decision, mm -hmm. uh, again, with some, a little bit of odd bedfellows. Um, Kennedy wrote them, or Brennan wrote the main opinion. Kennedy concurred. Um, and then there were two dissenting opinions, one of which was from Rehnquist, who said, this is such historical value. We need to 
uh, recognize that the flag is not just some other sort of symbol. It really has. And it was like this huge long opinion with all sorts of like songs and poetry and prose. And he really went all historical on us all right, and said, if this were up to me, I would say protect that baby. Okay. And um, the other one was um, Stevens, who we now sort of think of as a liberal, but my husband will tell me, tell you, if you ask him, was he, he was in law school, he was conservative, right? <laughs> How things change, right? So, you know, and his idea was he was sort of critical, like a, kind of a crit about it, and, and, and really looked at uh, flag burning in more of an abstract idea that is something that we should, that we should ban because of the idea that it is harmful, it has harm, potential to harm people. So this, people went crazy, crazy after this. Uh, Congress went nuts. In fact, there has been a flag desecration amendment proposed just about every Congress very early on. So it's always one of the early HRs or S proposals. It doesn't go anywhere for the most part. Um, but they, they passed a new law, a new federal law that Congress did in response to Texas versus Johnson. And in 1990, the other five were just, no, really, torch that flag. And that's what they said in Eichmann. <laughs> what we said in Texas versus Johnson, we meant it. <laughs> We're not going to forbid this. We're not going to permit states to arrest and, and punish people for political expression. And to me, this is it's so fascinating because the court really uh, in a, went against public opinion because most people don't like the idea of burning flags. Uh, in fact, I used to get pushback from my students sometimes just showing a picture of a burning flag, not a video or anything, just a photo of a flag or sometimes a photo montage of a flag. And they would get upset because they'd be like, well, people died for that flag. And my response is always, well, okay, that may be how they feel, but I'm going to bet that any soldier you ask would sacrifice a million flags for, for a life because yeah. that's what they, it is, right? And that's not something that people like to, like to think about is that you didn't die for the flag. You died for the ideas. You know, if a person dies for the flag, it's not really the flag. It's the ideals that are supported by the symbol of the flag democracy right. freedom of expression the meaning that we attach um, to the flag it's, it's precisely interesting. you know it's funny that you that you bring up kaepernick because um at least in my classes in the last couple of years i feel like the kaepernick protests have sort of moved younger people in a different way like i agree with you in the past students were like why would you burn a flag that's ridiculous it's insulting it's but the kaepernick protests it maybe opened I opened eyes or minds a little bit to the idea that look, you're not when you're burning a flag, you're not protesting the flag. You're you're making a statement about something that you disagree with in this democracy. When you're kneeling during the anthem, you're not protesting the anthem. You're you're protesting um, how Black lives are devalued in this culture. So I, it's the the Kaepernick case. Um, I just would be curious if it's had any general effect on public opinion when it comes to flag burning. The other aspect, that the place where I get pushback uh, from, from some students, is that I keep Texas versus Johnson in a line of cases that's primarily about hateful and offensive speech. And they're like, wait a minute, how is flag burning hate speech? I'm like, well, talk to someone who really opposes flag burning. They see that very much as hate speech. And I think um, with this, with the Stevens dissent, you do see that this kind of wrestling with this idea of, do we need some sort of um, new approach to speech that causes harm? And you see this kind of wrestling, almost as if the case wasn't really about flag burning, but about some other issues, cross burning and um, and offensive language, that sort of thing. It's just it's just a fascinating element of that. Like when I call it a top case, that's the area that is most interesting to me because today, what is the thing we wrestle with more than anything? What is the way to deal with hateful speech in this culture? Um, and certainly, um, flag burning is part of that important line of cases. You know, you tied it to Westboro Baptist Church. There's no real connection between them other than the harm that that speech is supposed to cause. Right. Well, you know, I and. Um... The, I, not the Supreme Court, but you know another court. When we talk about another area of hate speech, hate, ah, hateful speech, the Skokie case, mm -hmm. you know, the remedy then is to look away, right? And and I think about about, you know, I know that it is kind of glib for us to say, oh, just look away, right? Because um, I I don't 
not take this is so this is so terrible. I don't not take seriously those concerns, right? right? I do take them seriously because I do think that words have the power to wound. Um, but what would, would I ban them? No, I wouldn't. However, I don't walk a mile in those moccasins either. I did not, for example, live you know knock wood through Auschwitz or any of the terrible other um, Holocaust related issues, right? I'm, I'm too young for that. I'm not too young for most other things, but I'm too young for that. Um, but, and so, you know, some people would say to me, you know, and I have not served in the military. Right? Right. So, but I also have talked to, to soldiers uh, at all levels and, you know, their opinions are kind of divided too, right? They don't like flag burning. I mean, it's not like they are going to walk around burning flags, but they also acknowledge that, you know, when they fight under a flag, it is exactly as you said, right? It's a symbol uh, it, it's a, a bundle of ideas for which they fight that includes democracy and freedom and, um, you know, freedom from want, all sorts of things that get tied up in uh, what it means to be a, you know, a self-governing democracy. And, you know, for me, the reason this, I'm, I'm fascinated by this is because people are so polarized when you talk about this, mm -hmm. um, you don't get very many, oh, that's nice. You get really strong opinions, exactly. uh, pro or con. And that's changed. It's getting a little bit more, uh, I see more drama, at least in my classes for Westboro Baptist here. Well, and that may be because it's right next door. You know, people have driven by, people from Topeka have driven by them a million times. They're not very far from the Capitol, right? So I have to take a photo of them, in fact, for the book one of these days. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. I have one for a, for a student, but yeah. I think um, another interesting element of this is that, um, I'm, I'm not gonna recall his name, but a student in my class who um, was in the military raised the point, and that really honestly had not occurred to me before, <laughs> which makes me sound naive or stupid, I'm not sure which, uh, but saying, you know, it, it is not just flag burning that upsets those of us who have fought. There are, there are countless protests where flags are, are flown um, that we would never want to be associated with. So, you know, the American flag figured prominently in the um, white supremacist rallies at, at Charlottesville. You see the flag figured prominently now in these demands to reopen the economy. And you can imagine that anybody who um, has fought or had a family member who died in service of of our country could look at any of those protests and go, ah, <laughs> um, and that's yet, true. And that's yet true. still, still um, support the freedom that allows that. So right. How and strong do you think Texas versus Johnson is today? Do you think we're uh, we're in any danger of seeing that uh, decision re-argued and overturned? Well, I mean, you and your listeners know that the court is reactive, not proactive. So I don't. Uh, <sighs> If a case were, if that case were to come, I would be more, I would be worried. I mean, the way I look at how the court is make, made up of, what the court's makeup is now, they're very, is there anybody on that same court? You have to go through the, the people, but I don't, there's no Rehnquist, no O'Connor, no Stevens, no, no, Scalia. no Scalia, no Kennedy. Uh, and a lot of that, a lot of those folks are much more well, I don't have to tell you, right? Yeah. There's a there's a five four division, and the five ten, would tend to probably protect the flag. Would would err on the side if erring would happen in this case. Would err on the side of of forbidding flag desecration. And to me, that I mean, I hate to sound like you're you're you know the old grandma. This is a camel's nose in the tent, slippery slope. But I do worry about that. I mean, that's the stuff that keeps us media law scholars up at night, right? Is is this if this case were to come today, and that's one of the things I'm wrestling with in this in this book, is what about the earlier flag desecration cases would give precedential weight, in a sense, to a court that wanted, whose, whose members wanted to uh, elevate the flag, as it were, uh, to overturn Texas and Eichmann. Um, and that, you know, that keeps me up at night. I don't think that the court today would be as um, as willing to protect that area of speech. I mean, even, even, I mean, what was surprised to me was street back in street, even, um, you know, the very reliable Earl Warren dissented in street. I mean, people get even, 
even people who we view as liberal lions in a sense get skeevy when you talk about the flag because you know whether they've got family members who fought um or or um military folks in their family or uh, whatever you have people who you might think would be very willing to protect the flag uh or i'm sorry to um to uh protect freedom of expression like like warren generally was getting skeevy about this because it's so much different and that again is what back to the very beginning that's what fascinates me yeah. is the way in which you bring i mean i bring this is another this is an example i do um I sometimes teach a 45 words class as a as a introductory um, journalism course on the five rights of the First Amendment. So it's called 45 words, five rights of the First Amendment. And to teach Texas versus Johnson, I thought, well, what can I do that would be interesting? So I proposed doing a flag burning in public with a bunch of people and calling the, you know, getting this whole set up and say, we can be patriots and still acknowledge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the importance of flag desecration in our uh, scheme of liberal protection for expression. And I thought the administration was going to become unglued. Yeah. They went crazy. Uh, you know, do you want the three? They didn't say no, but the, we really think you should think hard about this. So I backed up. I said, okay, how about we do a picture of a flag burning? No. How about we uh, bring the Boy Scouts on campus uh, to do a flag um, to do a flag um, dem or demonstration of how they dispose of, of wounded flags, right, of, of old flags, which I found out later, they bring a, like a grill and you drop it in with the old hot dog grease. I mean, it's not very elegant or <laughs> anything. So I was like, and th no, okay, how about we, no, no, no. Oh. They did not want this on their, I mean, they did not forbid me, but, you know, we came from a campus where one of my former colleagues, he's, he's since retired, you know, tweeted against the NRA and, ended up under death threats. So, I mean, I kind of get why they're a little skeevy, skeevy about it. So, you know, we eat the flag now. That's my, my example is we eat the flag. <laughs> so I make, I have the, a bakery make a cake with a flag on it. I bring in a big knife and we cut the thing up and then we talk about, is this desecratory? And of course, under the flag code, as you know, the, the, maybe your, your soldier student was suggesting under the flag code, those sorts of things um, that's not okay, right? Napkins with Fourth of July napkins with a flag. I'm not supposed to be, right? right? I have I have a roll of toilet paper that I got from China with a flag on it. You can wipe your butt with the flag. Um, that's not flag code, right? Now your your student I think was talking about you know more about actual maybe what would be considered appropriate uses um, right. that aren't flag code problems. But there's a lot of problems of how we use the flag um, that are problematic not only under the flag code, which is a non enforceable code that sort of generally tells us how we should use flags in other words you know, you can have bunting but it can't be a real flag and and you know my students come down to the idea if, if we're eating the flag at the cake the flag cake uh, that's not a real flag well okay then tell me what is a real flag yeah. if we're if you and i are on a desert island we decide we want a flag and i'm happy to wear a t-shirt with a flag picture on it and i run that thing up the flagpole and we salute it doesn't make it a real flag yeah I don't know. Oh, you definitely so, picked a great one. This is, there are so Best case ever. Yes, yeah, the best case ever. It is. It is. Because it, it gets, we get to entangle ourselves with issues of patriotism and nationalism, which are, I think, two very distinct things, but both claim the mantle of the flag as, the, as a symbol for that. We have the, the tie-up of the military, which is huge. The consideration for uh, people who really would prefer to ban that speech because they think it's too harmful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the people uh, who, uh, you know, would not necessarily burn a flag, of course. I mean, and even Texas versus Johnson today, even though it is still good law, we still see uh, arrests for flag desecration. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was one a couple of years ago on the 4th of July in Illinois, where they said, well, we're going to let the we're going to let him go free while we reevaluate the status of the flag desecration law in, in Illinois. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's no good. <laughs> it's no good. Yeah. Texas versus Johnson. Here's a citation. So, and I've had arguments with people about whether or not flag burning is illegal even because some people still don't think that it is, yeah. that it is legal to burn the flag. Hate speech has no first amendment protection. Well, you're wrong. Exactly. Well, right. Exactly. And so to me, this case, gets all of those things together. Plus it has some cool history. It came out correctly if you're me. And it also um, ties into some popular culture issues like Kaepernick 
um, and race, you know, there's a race, r racial issue. Sydney Street was a, a man of color, mm -hmm. Colin Kaepernick, a man of color. If Colin Kaepernick had been Tom Brady, I often ask my students, would this have happened? Even if he were prote protesting Black Lives Matter? Oh, Tom right. Brady, of course, is a, is a god among, you know, <laughs> quarterbacks, um, but he's also white. <laughs> he's also white. Yeah. So, I mean, it ties in race too, however indirectly. Awesome. Well, Best case ever. So much. So thank you so much, Janelle. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. My pleasure.